Hi, I'm Laura El Tantawi. Welcome to my keynote for Photo Ideas, where I'll be speaking on the theme of witness. Um, to start, I'd like to begin by giving a short intro about myself, who I am, and a little bit about um, some of the key issues that I'll be discussing today. So I like to speak about my work in the context of beginnings and endings. Um, I feel that beginnings and endings are two defining points, um, basically in any story, our own personal story and in any narrative or project that we take on in the context of photography. And I love that the idea of beginnings and endings alludes to a journey. What I like about a journey is, you know, you can go in different directions. You could take one turn and you can make a U-turn. So the idea of a journey um, is about evolving and it's about discovery and exploration. And this is very much the way that I feel that I've engaged with photography. It's taken me on a journey of self-discovery, but also on a journey where I've been navigating the world and trying to make some sense and understanding of it. Um, I'm a British Egyptian photographer. I was born in a small village of Ronxwood in Worcestershire, UK. Um, it's actually so small that I think a lot of English people don't even know where Ronxwood is. Uh, but somehow my Egyptian parents managed to find it and they lived there for five years. And that's where I was born. Now, this idea of British Egyptian is something that's quite important to my own sense of identity. Um, I grew up navigating the space between as trying to claim a sense of identity as someone who's British growing up in Egypt. And then now I've been living in the UK for the last 14 years and there's a sense of longing to belong in Egypt, which is the country of obviously my parents, my ancestors, and it's a country where I feel strong sense of, um, um, a strong sense of home, so to speak, as much as home can encompass in meanings of memories, um, a sense of place, a sense of safety, all of these um, really loaded meanings. Um, in terms of photography, I actually never really expected to be a photographer. Photography is something that came sort of a little bit late in life by maybe other perceptions of other people and when they engage with photography. I was studying at university for a degree in politics and journalism. And I decided to take one photography course as a way to perhaps have fun or do something that's creative and less demanding. Um, towards my um, towards my degree and I absolutely fell in love with photography and I discovered that you could tell stories with images you can express feelings in photographs you can ask questions in an image and all of these are things that I really hold dear to me um, in my own work and I believe that my own engagement with photography what I'm really looking for is a sense of understanding. Um, for me, a photograph begins with a sense of understanding and a sense of empathy towards what I'm photographing. Um, I believe empathy is very important. I think it begins really there with empathy. And understanding comes through questions that I'm perhaps trying to answer myself. And on that, the photograph itself becomes a journey. Um, the context of witness, it's something I've really had to think about a lot in preparation for this keynote. Um, where does the idea of a witness begin? And had I not been a photographer, what would the, what would the word witness mean to me? I think we're now in a world where we've become so saturated with imagery. There are 1.8 trillion photographs taken each day. That's to the rate of two photographs. Um, a photograph um, every two minutes. So we're saturated with imagery. We're actually inundated with photographs um, on a daily basis that a photograph is almost kind of losing its meaning. Um, and this is something that interests me as a photographer because it challenges my role as a photographer and it challenges 
what it is that I want to say through my images. And I believe that the idea of a witness encompasses so many meanings. You can become a viewer of events. Um, you're watching something, but not necessarily partaking in it. It's also become loaded with legal meanings. That witness has become so attached to truth, uh, truth and the perception of what truth is. Um, in this context, I'm kind of reminded by the words of Sushitra uh, Vijayan, the founder of the Polis Project, who said that we live in a surveillance economy where we're constantly just bearing witness, which means that the capacity to see doesn't automatically become the capacity for action. What is the function of seeing something and saying something if it doesn't lead to concrete action or change? really had to think a lot about these words because in a way it directly confronts what I do as a visual creative. What is the value of an image? What is the value of a story? What is the value of what I'm saying? If we're so saturated with imagery, where is the impact? And as mentioned earlier, I feel that, you know, in the context of witness, I kept thinking about truth and a sense of responsibility. And I feel like all of these things are encompassed um, in my role as a photographer in going out to create images. There's the sense that I'm bearing witness to critical events, whether I put myself in a situation by choice or whether a big news event has happened and I'm there to document it. There's the idea of truth and responsibility. And truth is something that comes up a lot in the context of photography. Um, I think traditionally, particularly with the role of a photojournalist, truth is something that photojournalists do. You know, you're a fly on the wall, you're there as an observer, you're just showing events as they are. But I feel like in reality, in my own practice, truth is so much grayer than that. You know, you could change the perception of truth by changing the camera you're using, by looking in a different direction, by capturing a particular emotion. I mean, the subtleties of an image, you know, how somebody's uh, facial expression changes within the frame of a second from smiling to what looks like frowning or moments of joy to moments of sadness. I feel like this is all part of the sense of responsibility, the weight of the role of being a photographer and what that really means and the responsibility of it. Um, one of my favorite authors is Naguib Mahfouz. He's an Egyptian novelist and Nobel laureate. He was the first um, Arab and Egyptian to win a Nobel Prize for literature. Um, I actually grew up seeing Naguib Mahfouz on his early morning strolls at 6 a.m. along the River Nile. Um, we lived in the same neighborhood, and obviously I didn't know who he was at the time, but I remember, you know, on the school bus in the morning, the teachers with us would say, this is Naguib Mahfouz, and we'd all stick our heads out and say, Mr. Mahfouz, Mr. Mahfouz, and wave to him. So I have very fond memories of him, and growing up, I started to read his novels, and he has a very strong sense of the social and political landscape in Egypt and his picture, his books paint a very um, authentic image of the Egypt that I've then gone on to explore in my own photography. And I love his words on truth where he says it's an indication of truth's jealousy, that it's not made for anyone a path to it and that it hasn't deprived anyone of the hope of attaining it. And it has left people running in the deserts of perplexity and drowning in the seas of doubt. And he who thinks he's attained it, it disassociates itself from. And he who thinks he's disassociated himself from it has lost his way. So in many ways, truth is this really complex anomaly that we're all trying to reach. It's kind of this destination that seems a bit mysterious. And some of us feel like we're there. Some of us feel like we're still striving to attain the truth. And in many ways, I feel like this is really reflective of photography and in, in my own practice. I never really think of myself as a photographer, that I'm somebody that's 
portraying the truth because it's whose truth. And the, the work I'm about to show you, particularly in my series in the shadow of the pyramids, it's always very important for me to say that this is my truth, my version of the truth. So what you take away from it as a viewer is your take away from it. Um, and you take away your own version of the truth from it as well. And I love this idea that truth is an anomaly. We all think that it's this pure thing, but as a matter of fact, it's a, it's a destination. In the context of my images, um, this question of what is it that I want to say is something that's really relevant. Um, as mentioned, my journey with photography began when I was in university. Um, I fell in love with photography because of its value to um, explore emotions, emotions that are first my own as a viewer, as a witness, and as somebody that's documenting that moment. But what I also love about it is the idea of sharing that emotion, putting it out into the world, and hopefully having it resonate with people to one degree or the other. Um, in my practice, um, I believe politics plays a big role in my image making. You know, as an Egyptian, we're quite a politicized people. Politicized not so much in the sense of political practice, partaking in elections or political events, because the Egypt that I grew up in is one where we felt that our fate was always predetermined. So why vote in an election where you know, the results were rigged and so corrupt that our voice wouldn't really count. So I grew up in an Egypt where I felt as a young Egyptian that my voice wasn't important, that in fact, in order to attain a better life, a better future, a good job, this is not something I could, um, I could reach in Egypt. This is something that happened outside of Egypt. And if you're from a privileged background or a middle-class background, then you could obviously go to Europe or America and pursue studies, start a job, start a life. And you return to Egypt with as a successful person and as a beacon of somebody that succeeded outside and now is perhaps trying to plant this, those seeds in Egypt. So for me, politics is kind of like part of my my daily life it's you know you you eat um you eat and sleep with politics in egypt we're a very politicized people and in my own family my paternal grandfather is somebody that um was very interested in political issues he always read the daily newspaper from front to back he explained to me what was happening he talked about the issues of the day and on any given day people are always talking about politics so it's no wonder that my work has taken a focus on political issues, particularly in Egypt. And this idea of the struggle for dignity and respect within our own borders in Egypt. So in essence, um, I feel like my work has taken a focus on this idea of Egyptianness. What does it mean to be Egyptian? And you know, to a broader sense, this idea, the question of belonging, the idea of home, um, identity, um, rootness, rootlessness, or where do you really feel like you're most rooted? And I feel like in my series in the shadow of the pyramids um, is my first major series that I made. I worked on it from 2005 up until the very last photograph I took in 2014. Um, it's important to kind of introduce how this work began at the time um, up until 2004, from 98 to 2004, I was living in the US where I did my university degree. And then I worked as a newspaper photographer for about three or four years. And in working as a newspaper photographer, um, um, I think it was a really, really uh, empowering way to begin my career in photography in the sense that it gave me the skills to create images in any given situation. It was really the best training ground for me on any given day. I would photograph a news event, um, a sports event, a portrait of a business person. So in any given situation, I really had to come back with some results. So it really flexed my creativity in the sense of um, having to create an image that was somewhat creative and appealing 
in any context that maybe wasn't entirely photographable. In the lead up to that, um, while I was living in the US, I was constantly receiving calls from my maternal grandmother asking me to come back to Egypt saying that, you know, we really miss you. We want you back home with us. Um, why don't you come back? And in 2005, she unexpectedly passed away. And of course I wasn't there for that. And this is really the beginning of In the Shadow of the Pyramids. I decided to come back to Egypt in order to honor her memory, um, honor the fact that of achieving what I'm doing in her death that I couldn't do while she was alive. And it seemed like it was the right time for me to come back and navigate my family life and also my own country and see, you know, where I fit in as an Egyptian. So I, it's a first person account exploring my, uh, my memory and identity. But in later on in 2011, as I'm going to show you later, we had the, the Egyptian revolution of January 25th, 2011, just had the 10th anniversary. And, um, the series took on a greater sense of urgency for me and it became much more than a personal narrative. It became a story about an entire country that I felt was struggling for its own sense of identity. Upon returning to Egypt in 2005, I was initially confronted by memories. You know, I had been living away from Egypt for 10 years. I came back a changed person and obviously I came back to a country that had also changed, but more critically, a family structure that had changed with the sudden death of my grandmother, who was the bond that kept the family going. And my maternal grandfather, her husband was also quite ill at the time. So there were big family shifts happening and it was really quite chaotic to return to that emotionally chaotic to return to that and try to make sense of it. So for me, looking back in family memories was really the beginning, you know, these sepia toned images of these innocent um, childhood memories, uh, memories with my parents, family holidays, beach holidays, all of these beautiful memories that I returned to and try to make sense of this big gap between those memories and where I was now. Upon returning to Egypt, photography really became a way for me to navigate these emotions, this feeling of feeling lost, feeling a sense of internal chaos, a sense of um, confusion and being perplexed by everything that was happening around me. You know, obviously the family was struggling emotionally to make amends with the idea that, you know, this these, this critical family figure, my grandmother had suddenly gone and her husband is now slowly dwindling. So we were all trying to make sense of it. And I feel very fortunate that photography was, my camera was there for me as a way to make amends with these feelings. And initially I wasn't trying to tell any story. I was just taking these fragmented images, um, not necessarily on a daily basis, but as frequently as I could. And when I felt that I, have, that I had something to say. Um, images like this from the apartment where I was living at the time in downtown Cairo. This is taken during a sandstorm um, in March and April. Um, we have the, the season where we're often um, experiencing these sandstorms. These sands come blowing in from the Sahara Desert and they often cover the city in this hue of orange, which I find quite beautiful to photograph. But obviously, if you're in it, then it's quite problematic and, um, and troubling to experience. But for me, these were all fragments of my memory. You know, this is a window that I grew up standing, standing out and looking onto the city that was forever changing. At some point, we used to see the pyramids from this view and obviously with you know, the growing population, buildings were rising and it was becoming an immensely populated city. Um, Cairo is a city of nearly 20 million people. Egypt as a whole is a country of 100 million people. Um, it's the Arab world's most populated country. 
And I see this story as one of a hundred million. This is my Egypt and this is my version of being a witness of my own experience of Egypt. So by no means is this an expression of the state of Egypt today is just an impression of my Egypt. So again, taking these, um, these images that were reminders perhaps of, you know, these childhood memories that I showed you earlier on and continuing on by exploring daily aspects of Egypt. And again, inspired to go to particular areas and parts of the city of Cairo that I hadn't seen so far, you know, again, inspired by the work of Nagib Mahfouz and the neighborhood, the neighborhood he would go to in old Cairo, Al Hussein, um, Khan Al Khalili, one of the coffee shops he loved to frequent is called Al Fishawi. I went to all of these areas with these figures that I had read about in his books that seemed so real to me. And I kind of tried to see, you know, was it this person that he wrote about? Was it that person? So I was hugely inspired by his words and his books. And this was really it kind of opened the door to me to explore a different Egypt because Egypt is one of the, it's a very class-based society. So if you grow up within a particular segment, it's quite difficult to really mix outside of it. And photography has again been a way for me to explore these, these territories that I wouldn't have otherwise seen. And I feel again, very fortunate to be able to do that. And at the time I was sort of going out with certain emotions, like, you know, reading the news and talking to my grandfather and going out with these loaded, loaded ideas of what Egypt means to me and what Egypt is. And for me, I've always felt like Egypt is a place where people are really struggling to find a sense of self. This is largely to do with the kind of politics that we grew up in. We grew up in a country where we were constantly ruled under an iron fist. Um, we felt alienated by our governments. We felt that, um, you know, the we are sort of like ruled by the one percent, and nothing that we say or do necessarily counts. So, we grew up definitely lacking a sense of agency over our own destiny, but also over what's happening in the country. So this idea of a sense of loss, um, a sense of, you know, um, lacking in the idea of a dream. You know, I remember when I was studying in school in Egypt, no teachers ever talked to us about the idea of dreaming or looking out into the future and trying to build a plan for what it is that you wanna be or even imagining in an ideal world, what it is that you want it to be. So the idea of dreaming is something that we were always longing for as Egyptians, you know, it almost seemed like something that happens when you're asleep, but once you wake up, you realize this is completely unattainable. Um, so I think, you know, inspired by my readings, um, inspired also by filmmaking, you know, Egyptian filmmakers are, quite renowned, particularly old generation of filmmakers, uh, people like Yusuf Shaheen, Salah Abu Saif, uh, Atif al -Tayyib, and their movies, which are always quite political and socially engaged as well. You know, it was really inescapable for me to do something that wasn't within the realm of social and political engagement and reflecting on the state of that. And again, you know, images like this going, this was me going on um, a trip to an oasis, which is about nine hours from Cairo. It's an oasis in the middle of the desert. And I worked there for a bit. And I was, again, it was a way for me to just understand the country and what was happening at the time and seeing the landscape and the geography of the country. And this was an image that I made on a rest stop during that journey um, on a bus. And um, if you maybe know a little bit, you know that in 2011, there was um, a political, a, a streak of political revolutions that took across the Middle East, beginning in Tunisia, um, with the removal of then President Zainuddin al Abidin. And then on January 25th, we had a 
major protest movement on the streets of Cairo and across the country. January 25th is National Police Day. Um, at the time, there was an incident which, with images that circulated online, it was the death of a young man called Khaled Said in uh, the coastal city of Alexandria. Pictures of him circulated online of his uh, basically deformed body. He was held in police custody and he died while in police custody. So these images started to circulate online, um, basically angering everybody and publicly um, they really uh, steered uh, the January 25th movement. You know, the fact that the protests took place on that day is no coincidence. It was an act of uh, protest against police authority. Um, and it was a movement on Facebook called We Are All Khaled Said. They are the ones that galvanized the protest and people took to the streets chanting bread, freedom, social justice. Um, for me, really, in documenting the revolution is the first time that I felt that my work took on a sense of urgency. It's almost like what I was doing became so much larger than me. And I felt like, you know, I've been photographing since 2005, and now I really need to commit to this work. And I really need to commit to what's happening because I realized that this is the story of my generation. You know, at the time I was 30 years old and I... Um, we had really all known one president. You know, we had President Mubarak who had been ruling for nearly 30 years. So it felt, everything felt so familiar. You know, it almost felt like, you know, you're just kind of waking up into the system and we didn't really know if, if it was ever gonna come to an end. I have to say that as early as 2005, when I came to Egypt, there were already political movements taking place. There was a movement called Kifaya or the Enough Movement. And it was a movement that galvanized people on the streets. And at the time uh, they were protesting against um, a rumor that President Mubarak was gonna hand over power to his youngest son, Gamal, who was educated and worked in the UK as a banker. And he'd returned to Egypt and married here. And you know there was word that Mubarak was gonna hand over power to him. And people obviously were angered by that. And there were protests as early as 2005 against Mubarak and his regime. But it was really in 2011 that those protests picked up six years later. I mean, within that period, Egyptians, as Egyptians, we knew that something was going to happen at some point. We just didn't know when. So in photographing um, around those events, I feel like I never really looked at the events in Egypt or around Tahrir Square in particular, which is the square in central Cairo, which uh, where the protests happened, uh, were centered in 2011. And it's also, it's Tahrir Square means liberation square. It's a square where oftentimes over and over, over the years, major protests have happened. It's quite an icon for the voices of dissent. You know, when President Sadat was ruling, there were bread riots that took place in Tahrir Square during the Gulf War protesters took their um, against the US attacks on Iraq. So, you know, it's Sahrir Square has always been the icon of revolution in Egypt. So it's no wonder that in 2011, the protests were centered there. Um, but what I always felt in, in Egypt is that I'm telling a people's story. I'm witnessing a people's story. It's the story of my generation. And this made it quite challenging for me because um, I always felt like I was photographing my own story. You know, I talked earlier on about returning to Egypt with all of these questions about my own sense of identity and really trying to make amends with who I was as an Egyptian. And I felt that for the first time in Egypt, when I was in Tahrir Square, there was a sense of unity in this question of who we are as Egyptians and um, let's determine our faith and our identity together. You know, as Egyptians, we are by virtue, really sentimental people. This is by nature of our ancient civilizations. We're very proud of our ancient Egyptian civilization and we're people that often look back more than we look forward. And what was unique about the 18 days of protest in Tahrir Square, which eventually ended with 
President Mubarak stepping aside. What was unique about that time is that it was for the first time I felt like we were looking out onto the future and we were trying to plan ahead. People were in Tahrir Square um, fighting for the future of their children, fighting for uh, their sense of dignity and respect, fighting for food, you know, this chant, bread, freedom, social justice. You know, the word bread in Arabic is Aish, and Aish is basically means life. So for us, you know, bread is about survival. So people were chanting bread, freedom, social justice. Um, in the sense, in the context of telling a story that was changing constantly, you know, on any given day while these protests were happening, the story and how it was um, being narrated in the news was constantly changing, manipulated. There was a lot of brainwashing happening. You know, you'd imagine when you're looking at the news from afar that everybody in Egypt was on the streets. But as a matter of fact, that wasn't the case. You know, there was a very big segment of the population that didn't agree with the January 25th movement. They chose to watch the protests on their TV screens. So a lot of the information they were receiving was only via their screens. And hence that was um, prime territory for manipulation and manipulation of public opinion in order to put pressure on the protesters in Tahrir Square to go home. So for me as a photographer, I think this idea of witness is really critical here. I was going to these events and I was seeing things that then when I went home and watched the news, it was a completely different message. One of those was at the time when the Muslim Brotherhood had a big presence in the square. Now, just to contextualize it, the Muslim Brotherhood is and has long been the only opposition movement um, in Egypt. So for the 30 years that Mubarak was in power, the only other political movement that was there was the Muslim Brotherhood. It's a movement that's built around religion. Obviously, Islam is its philosophy. It's a movement that appealed, appealed to a huge sector of Egyptian society. They basically filled the gap wherever the government wasn't providing. So they provided hospital care for the poor, education. Um, they're an extremely organized um, group. Um, they're excellent with, you know, uh, managing events, delegating power. They're, they're, so they basically filled a very large hole. So it's no wonder that in the aftermath of the revolution in 2012, um, we had a, the first democratically elected president, Mohamed Borsi, who was from the Muslim Brotherhood. It was their chance to you know, come to power after all these struggles and to show the people what they have. But at the time when they were in power, you know, the, already the news media was reporting that no women were allowed to take part in the protests because of the Muslim Brotherhood's influence. So as somebody that was in the square, I felt that this was completely untrue. So I photographed images of this nature to show the influence that women had. You know, the, the protests were a very empowering moment for women in Egypt and for young women in particular, you know, for me as a photographer and for me as an Egyptian woman, I felt very empowered with this movement. Women were on the front lines of the movement fighting shoulder to shoulder with men. And they were in the back alleys, you know, attending to the wounded and helping them um, uh, to heal. So in the context of bearing witness to something, I feel like as a photographer, I was oftentimes choosing to point my camera at certain people in certain situations in order to um, confront this other narrative that I was hearing and to prove that this wasn't actually the case. But in doing so, I think it's important to show that I was, by turning my camera towards someone, I was turning it away from somebody else. So there's bias there. That's why, you know, this is my version of these happenings. Somebody else next to me was photographing potentially a completely different story. And it's inter interesting to see different imagery that came out from the time. And again, um, this is probably the image that really stands out for me that I always return to from my coverage um, of these events in Egypt. Um, this is an image I took in 2012. This was outside the police academy where um, you know, then the ousted President Mubarak and the interior minister 
were be were in court on charges of giving orders to kill protesters. And on this particular day, the court had decided that Mubarak and the interior minister were innocent, that they did, they did not give orders to um, for police to shoot protesters. And I met this woman, Safiya Abdelaziz Mohammed. She is a mother and her son was killed during the protests. And for me, the reason this isn't the image that always rises to the surface when I think of Egypt and my coverage is I believe it's an image that still resonates today. Um, there's obviously the sorrow and pain in her eyes, but I also feel like there's this sense of acceptance that, you know, this is this is what the court has decided, this this power, and I just have to accept it and somehow, you know, move on with my life. I remember her first words after the court announced its uh, verdict was, who's going to get my son's rights back now? And I think images like this still resonate for me today, this idea that when you have such a major political movement and this big revolution, essentially an overhaul of the system, what's left of the people behind and uh, what mark does this leave on people, whether it's the emotional wound or the physical wound. Um, in some of the images I'm going to show you later, people who lost their eyesight or were killed or wounded during the protests, what mark does that leave on them? Um, again, you know, even around the revolution, there was this sense of confusion. There were days where there was a sense of euphoria, a sense of confusion, a sense of trying to understand what is happening. Where are we going? What is the sense of direction that we're taking? Um, um, a sense of lacking in, in clarity of our destination. I think this is that we've always felt and during the revolution, there were days where that sense was there as well. So images like this with people attending to the wounded who were shot uh, or injured during the protests. Um, police confrontations, it was really difficult. You know, I photographed the protests for uh, probably four years. And when you photograph, you know, protests so many times, it becomes really, um, really difficult actually to continue to make new images because everything starts to look the same. And I never really felt that what was happening was about a sign or a banner that somebody was carrying. For me, the story was always rooted in people and their fight for dignity and respect. So this was always what I was trying to show in my images. Um, but I was also really uh, burdened by this fact that you know, this is such a huge event. It's like sitting on the edge of history and watching something really important happening and knowing that something really important is happening and photographing it. And I was always wondering, are my images really reflecting the weight of this moment? Um, are my images um, really showing the reality and, um, you know, the emotion the weight of the emotion that I'm feeling in this moment and that I know people around me are feeling. And I think this is part, again, what I talked about earlier, the idea of being a witness and truth and the sense of responsibility that comes with it. I think this, this is something that comes up for me a lot. You know, even now, 10 years on or more after these images, um, with the context of you know, how the story has been relayed over the 10 years, certain things have been erased, other things have, you know, kind of stepped in and forced themselves into the narrative around the events that took place at the time. And, you know, my images remain and they've become this fragment of a memory of that time. And what does that memory um, hold now? What do these images say now? And I end where I begin. I began with an image from the apartment where I grew up with the view. This is another image, completely different feeling um, of the same apartment view, um, obviously with the sunset view and with, um, you know, the window. The window is, um, 
is a recurring theme in my work in Egypt. And I think in my work in general, this idea of trying to relate to the outside, um, you know, inside looking out, both metaphorically speaking and obviously physically speaking, the sense of trying to belong and really trying to understand my surroundings and this question of longing to be on the outside, but in being on the outside, you have to feel accepted and you have to feel a sense of, um, again, uh, belonging to be there. Um, once again, Nagib Mahfouz, uh, you know, I'm really, um, I, love, I love his words. And this is one that I felt really rings true in this sense. Uh, the calendar has a magic that makes us imagine a memory can be resurrected and revived but nothing returns. And it was important for me to introduce this here because I'm about to show you the, um, in the Shadow of the Pyramids, the book. And, you know, at the end of uh, doing the series from 2005 to 2014, I came to the end and I decided that I would like to work on a book now for this work. Um, you know, coming to the end of a, body of work of this breath is always um, sort of a blurry question, you know, is this going to end? When is it going to end? And I feel like in 2014, actually as early as 2013, I felt like I was already coming to the end of photographing in Egypt. You know, as I said earlier, I, for me, understanding and empathy are two starting points to any image. And I felt that at 2013, I stopped having a sense of clarity about the events in Egypt. There had been too much violence, too much death, too much blood. I didn't understand Egypt, the Egypt that I knew anymore, the Egypt that I knew from my childhood memories, those innocent sepia-toned images that opened the door for me to explore Egypt. I felt like the door was suddenly shut and I didn't understand the Egypt I was seeing anymore. And I felt that this really shut me down from being able to take pictures. Um, and this is when I felt like the work was done and now I needed to move on to the book. The idea of a making a book for me was one about seeing the work as a whole, having an object that has staying power, but also living power, something that's gonna be there. Um, over the years, something that I can look on later down the line, something I can share with people to show them these events and what happened, um, and something I can pass on to, you know, my nephews and nieces to tell them, this is the Egypt that you didn't experience. This is my impression of it. So you're seeing two versions of the book. On the left, you're seeing the first edition, which I created in 2015. And on the right, you're seeing the version that I just released in 2021. So there's a 10 year gap between both. Um, to be honest with you, I never really um, thought that I would release the book again. For me in the shadow of the pyramids that I released in 2015 was the book. And I felt like I said everything I had to say in this book. Um, the version in 2015 is quite an impressionistic meditation on the events you're seeing, and it's also a very personal take on the events. It's a book that is designed um, to take you on a one-day experience. You know, the images begin small, floating on this white space, and then they get bigger, and suddenly you're inundated with all of these events. Uh, you're kind of hearing the sounds and sort of smelling the, you know, the smell of potentially what was there to be, and it becomes really chaotic, and you feel stuck in this narrative somehow, and it's interspersed with my childhood images, and also bits of text that I wrote during the years about my Egypt, what was happening, where I fit in, what's happening in the country, Tahrir Square. It's a very personal and lyrical exploration of the events, and 10 years on, um, I've suddenly felt the urge to release the book again, looking at the same images, but recontextualizing them in a way that shows how whitewashed the events have happened. You know, what is the value of these original images that I made between 20, 2005 to 2014? What value do they have today? 
in the 21, 2021 version of the book, you know, the two books are exactly the same size. Um, the new book, I believe, is a bit thicker. Um, it has an embossed title on the front. It's kind of a way to really stamp the events and really mark them as happening. In the new book, when you initially look at it, it's just white pages, and then you really have to make this effort to unfold them, to peel into the memory of these events and look back into it. So I really wanted to create a book that took you as a viewer on as much of a journey of how this narrative has become so fragmented, so whitewashed as it has over the last 10 years. I mean, we're in an Egypt today where January 25th isn't really recognized as much of a political event. It's actually seen as a chaotic event, an event that destroyed the country's economy, an event that caused chaos. Um, a lot of the major figures that took part in the protests are now either behind bars or they have left the country. We're in an extremely polarized country now, whereas, you know, during the time and leading up to the 2011 protests, we were a country that was pretty much united in its sense of, um, you know, this, this need for a revolution, this need for change. Um, so for me, the 2021 book is one where the images are secondary, which is um, quite unique, I think, in a photography book, but it was very important for me to really contextualize it and have the, the dates where the images and the events were taken um, sort of precede the photographs in this book um, and to really root the images in the history around them, which is the dates that they happen. And you're seeing the images and the book you know, you're seeing the images in the order they were taken. So you begin in 2005 and you end in 2014. Whereas in the first version, it's narrated purely based on emotion and feeling. Um, one of the other versions that I did of this work was a newspaper edition that I released um, in 2015. Now, the newspaper version was a very exciting way for me to engage with an Egyptian audience. You know, in with the release of the first in the shadow of the pyramids, I realized very quickly that the book wasn't really reaching an Egyptian audience, and it felt um, it felt a bit hypocritical for me, you know, to create a body of work of this nature on such a big and historic event in Egypt and not have it filter and reach Egyptian audience. So I created a newspaper version again, honoring you know in a way, my own grandfather's uh, memory as somebody who was, you know, in love with newspapers, but also I think honoring our history, you know, Egypt is one of the first countries to publish newspapers in the Middle East and the Arab world. And, you know, honoring also the, the importance of this news event, this critical news event that happened in Egypt. And I love, you know, the smell of a newspaper, the touch of a newspaper. So it was a different way to show the work and it was a different way to introduce different images as well. So it's a newspaper that comes with two inserts. Um, one is shows a series of uh, close-up faces that I took in the square. And the other one is a series that shows people who were wounded and people who died um, during the revolution. It's in Arabic. Um, there's translations available on my website, but it's called the Shab, which means the people. And um, it's all in Arabic and it's in the words of the people. So unlike the first edition of the book in 2015, which was all in my own words and my own story, this is one where people are telling their own words and include some of the graffiti and some of the words that people were chanting like bread, freedom, social justice. So it's a completely different take on the events. And um, it's one that I give out for free to Egyptians because I believe, you know, every Egyptian should have it if I can, but, you know, I can't really publish a hundred million copies, unfortunately. Um, one of my favorite quotes by Susan Sontag, which I'm sure you know, and her, you know, her, her iconic book on photography says photographs are a way of imprisoning reality. One can't possess reality. One can possess images. One can't possess the present, but one can possess the past. 
And I feel this is, you know, really encompassing of what photography is. And particularly, you know, it really echoes how I feel about my images um, from in the shadow of the pyramids. They've become this, this memory, you know, this way of looking into the past. And, you know, when I look out that same window from my apartment building in downtown Cairo today, I get a very different sense of the Egypt that I photographed back in those days from the one that I see now. Um, it's difficult for me to relate to the Egypt that there is now, emotionally relate to it. Whereas back then I, I felt like I understood and I had empathy with what was happening. And now, you know, these images are just part of the past. Um, my second body of work, and if you're, um, if you're lucky enough to be able to attend the exhibitions during Photo 21, I'm actually showing in the shadow of the pyramids and beyond here's nothing, both as installations side by side. And what I really love about that is, you know, it opens the door to seeing both images in the way that both see bodies of work in the way they were created. Beyond Here is Nothing was very much born out of um, in the shadow of the pyramids. You know, at the end of working in Egypt, I was confronted with the question of, you know, a sense of um, what is home? You know, I had been working in Egypt to reclaim my identity and reclaim Egypt as my home. And at the end, with the events that took place, I felt completely confused by what I had experienced, completely confused by the Egypt that I had seen. And from there was the question of then, what is home? Where do I go now? What's next? Beyond Here's Nothing is... <laughs> something that I was creating from 2012 to 2017. You know, in my work and in my projects, I'm somebody that works quite organically on projects. You know, I'm not a heavy researcher in the sense that I don't research heavily in the lead up to creating a series for me. I create out of a sense of feeling that I have something to say and feeling very passionate and strongly that I really want to express this. And this is really the beginning of the image. And obviously, again, the idea of trying to understand and having a sense of empathy. Beyond Here's Nothing came out of this sense of, you know, for many years I had felt I carried this feeling within me, this heightened sense of anxiety that I couldn't really locate. I didn't really know where, where it was coming from, but I did know it was all happening you know, uh, inside my belly, so to speak. Um, the sense of always looking for something. I always felt like I was searching, you know, trying to look, feeling anxious about things. And I never knew what it was, but I located it eventually. And I realized it was out of this longing to belong. You know, I'd lived in the UK where I was born and I had this British identity. But I, when I was in the UK, I never really felt British. And when I came back to Egypt, I never felt entirely Egyptian. So there was always this sense of feeling like I'm missing out on something or that I'm trying to prove something to myself, but also um, to, you know, the sense of Egyptianness or Britishness, so to speak. Um, in the aftermath of In the Shadow of the Pyramids also, I really felt like I wanted to take a step back from photography in the sense of, you know, during the revolution, there were images everywhere all the time. All I had to do was go somewhere and create an image. And I felt um, quite exhausted by that mentally and emotionally. And I really wanted to take a step back and revisit photography from the beginning, you know, the purity of photography. So in the sense of bearing witness, I think it was taking many steps back from witnessing a major historic and political event in one of you know, the biggest countries in the world to taking many steps back and witnessing um, a purely internal journey and creating images purely out of reflecting on an emotion I was feeling. Um, it's quite organic, quick, and also by the same standards, very slow. I was traveling a lot of the time. So I had my phone with me all the time. All of these images were taken on my iPhone. 
And it was a way for me to really get excited about photography again, um, changing the way I was photographing, really limiting myself to the vertical, um, the, the vertical window through my phone, through which I was now experiencing the world and really trying to make images that were confronting me with this sense of anxiety and trying to meditate through that by creating these images. Um, and taking images through my journeys, you know, different places. Um, it's a very different language from in the shadow of the pyramids, but I believe that it's as um, impressionistic in, in quality as what you see in, in the shadow of the pyramids. And it's as metaphorical and personal to me as in the shadow of the pyramids. And I do feel that my works come in chapters, you know, one leads to the other. And I think what's really important in my work and what I've discovered is important for me is the sense of authenticity. You know, what is it that I can say that I can tell with as much honesty and authenticity as I can? And, you know, my work explores social and environmental issues that affect a lot of people, that a lot of people can understand and have experienced one way or another or have read about or seen. But my work is purely inspired by my own background, my own experience and my own history um, and trying to understand so much about these things as well. Um, so the images are quite fragmented. Um, they're quite slow. They're more silent, you know, in the shadow of the pyramids is, um, there's a sense of energy in the shadow of the pyramids. And I think here there's a sense of um, silence perhaps, or a quieter, a quieter sound than there is in, in the shadow of the pyramids. And bookmaking is really, really important in my practice. You know, I've just released my fifth monograph and I still feel like I'm learning so much about books. I don't design my own books. I work with a designer. We work on a concept that, um, I initially propose and with Beyond Here's Nothing, what was really important for me was to create a book that um, in a way, as much as possible, handed you as a viewer, all of these different feelings that I felt on the journey in making this work. I talked about the sense of anxiety, the sense of longing to belong, searching, feeling confused, um, you know, trying to find answers essentially. And I really wanted to create a book that while you looked at it as a viewer, you experienced as much of these feelings as I could. And it took you on the same journey as the one I went on in creating it. Um, it's a book that when you first look at it, you experience it the way that I want you to see it. And when you reach the end, if you reach the end, as I do here in this video, then you suddenly have to put it back together and you're confronted with this idea. What do I do with this? How do I put it back together? It's frustrating for a lot of people. Some people really, really resent this book and feel like it's one of the most confusing books and they don't want to deal with it. But people who really get it, they really enjoy it. And I feel like for me as a photographer, I'm giving you my images and telling you to create your own narrative as much as possible with it you know it's a book that you have to sit down with and engage with it with both hands it's not a book that you can flip through as you see people doing in bookshops or photo book fairs it's a book that you really have to sit down with and meditate through it and take your time with it and depending on what mood you're in you can start to create your own you know your own images and you can you know, sit with it on any given day, your mood changes, the set of images you're choosing changes. So for me, it's one of the most exciting books I've worked on, actually. It was a really difficult book to make, and it took a long time to make and to put out and to see how people perceived it. Um, but it's a book that I really love. It's very close to my heart because it all, it's also very reflective to the spirit of bookmaking and what bookmaking is for me. What I really love about a book is a book that takes you on a journey and a book that um, makes you feel something. 
I think it's really difficult to do that with an object. How does an object make you feel something? Of course, an object with images in it is different because images by nature, by, by their own virtue, are inundated with questions and feelings and emotions. Uh, but I think to bring all of those alive and engage all of that in a book is something that really, really excites me. And I have to say, bookmaking has really, um, you know, it's it's really reignited the flames for me when it comes to photography. I feel like in the shadow of the pyramids at the end of it, before making the book, I felt like maybe I just don't want to take any more pictures again. But in the process of working in the book, it really excited me again that you could take an image and give it a different life. And I love this also about photography. And I love to work with images in a way of, you know, wherever I put an image, it's in a book, it's on a website, it's in an exhibition. For me, it's an opportunity to give the image a new life and the work as a whole a new life. Um, so this is just a bit about my engagement with bookmaking. Lastly, I'd like to go through my current body of work, which I've also been working on for some time. It's called I'll Die For You. I'll Die For You is a series that I began in 2008. Um, it's a series that's inspired by my own pat paternal grandfather. He was a farmer his whole life. And I grew up hearing so many stories about him and hearing about how much I resemble him as a person. So he was quite an enigmatic and mysterious person for me, but also somebody I was incredibly curious about in trying to understand how do I resemble this man that I've never met and only encountered in photographs. Um, in 2008, I visited India for the first time. I went there as a tourist inspired by so many images that I'd seen by other photographers of India, this country that's energetic, vibrant, exploding with colors and energy. So I went there um, to find this India and to try to make images of it. And I did. And I found an India where I felt people worked incredibly hard to survive in order to avert death. In many ways, India reminded me of Egypt. Our histories are actually intertwined in the sense we were both colonized by England, by the British for so many years. Um, so I felt like there was a sense of bureaucracy and red tape and this history, this imprint that colonization has that I felt that, you know, was that I experienced in Egypt. And also I felt like the sense of um, really working hard in order to put food on the table was a, certainly a, a part of a daily life sequence that I could relate to in Egypt, the Egypt that I encountered. So India is very close to my heart, you know, it kind of feels like a third home, so to speak. And upon my return from that first trip, I came across an article on farmer suicides in India. And it was actually described as an epidemic that up until that point, um, for the past 25 years, there had been 300,000 farmer suicides in India. The essence of the issue is due to micro debts, uh, farmers borrowing money to invest in the land, to buy seeds, crops, um, create an irrigation system in the country, buy fertilizers. And due to these erratic weather patterns and the global warming that our world is experiencing, you know, the if the crops don't produce, then they can't sell it and they can't repay the debts. So essentially these debts start to accumulate and they're left with these huge debts. Um, I say huge by Indian standards, by rupee standards, but actually but by dollar standards and by Western standards, they're quite minuscule amounts. I mean, $600, $100. I don't think I met any farmer who had borrowed more than that. Um, and yet they committed suicide. So for me, it was quite a shocking story to read. It was one that confronted me with a different India than the one that I had encountered in India where people were um, so desperate to the brink that they took their own lives um, as the only way out. So I went to India um, really just to try to meet the families and understand why this issue was happening. Why were people killing themselves? So I went to a particular village in Vidarbha in Maharashtra where people speak Maharati and I had somebody working with me who was translating from Maharati to English. And we basically started by going to a police station 
and we received a list of the names of all the people who committed suicide in this area with their addresses and we went door to door. And um, the person I was working with, the lady I was working with would go to the families first and approach them and say, I have a photographer with me who wants to hear your story about what happened and the suicide. And, you know, in most cases people would let me in and, you know, I'm in no illusion that this is probably due to the fact that I'm a foreigner. Again, it's something that I quite understand because in Egypt for a very long time and up until today to a sense, you know, foreigners receive so much more um, respect and maybe doors open to them more than Egyptians. And I think in India, perhaps this is a little bit of what I experienced as well. You know, as a foreign photographer, I think people were excited to receive me, curious, but also maybe hopeful that I could take their story and bring it out to the world. And in that sense, something um, would change for them. And I think this comes back again to the point of bearing witness and the sense of responsibility that comes with that. You know, I was always telling people I'm here for myself. You know, I don't have a contract with a magazine to have it published. I'm here to listen to your story and I will try to get it published, which I have. But I think it's important to always be honest about intention with who I'm photographing and not to put people in a sense of expecting something that they may not receive. Um, so essentially for me, this series is about putting a face on the issue of suicides. But, you know, I've been working on this from 2008 up until now. I've now photographed in multiple countries, in India, Nepal, Peru, Egypt, in my own grandfather's village, in Ireland, in the Palestinian territories. And what I've really been doing is looking at the relationship between man and land you know we're in a world we're in a globalized economy where i think you know if you live in a city you you don't really understand or actually can't visually comprehend or emotionally comprehend the strong bond that we have with the land the earth you know we sit and we consume our salads and our food for lunch and I don't think we often think about the source of where it's come from or the hands that have touched this food in order to get it to where we are. So it's a very tactile relationship. And what I found is that despite the fact that the issues farmers are confronting in each country are quite individual, there are two main things that remain true. The fact that the weather is changing erratically, the seasons are changing and the farmers can't keep up with it. And so, the crops are not growing the same, they're losing money and they don't know what to do. They're more poor than they used to be. The second thing is that a farmer is an extremely proud person. You know, my own grandfather was that way and every farm I've encountered is extremely proud of what they do. And this is why this idea of failure in their perception, you know, not being able to pay a debt back or not being able to provide for their family is something that hits very strongly hence the suicides and the sense of shame is uh, very much part of it. In the Palestinian territories, I was really interested in looking at the Israeli occupation and how it's alienated farmers from their land. And I was left with this question of what's left of a farmer when his land is no longer his, you know, when he can't go and work on the land and touch the earth and plant the seeds and see them grow. So for me, each country is an individual issue and I've tried to photograph the series in different ways um, in order to honor the uniqueness of each issue, but also so that I'm not repetitive and I'm not just making the same images everywhere that I go. In Palestinian territories, it was very important for me. I worked in multiple exposures, so to put the farmer and the land essentially in one frame, to compensate for the fact that they were forced apart. But in the image, I was really trying to bring them apart together again. And um, in India, it was very important for me to put a face on the suicides and to create this eye contact between the viewer. Well, first myself, obviously as a photographer and the farmer who killed himself, but, uh, but obviously also to give you as the viewer, this idea of looking in the eyes of the farmers 
and you know understanding that it's suicide it's not an abstract issue it's something that's very real and these are the people who have been faced by it and you know the the title i'll die for you you know i'll die for you is something that you know we usually encounter in, in movies and in, in romance and i think what I'm really trying to say with this series is that this bond between man and land is very much along the lines of the strong bond in the same way that we encounter in personal relationships. It's a bond that in a way it's beyond comprehension. You know, the farmer, um, the farmer is there to aid the land in, in survival, but the, the land is also the way that the farmer survive so both become one and the same and if one is not there then the other is going to cease to exist as well and I began to explore that by looking at details from the landscape and the details of the skin of the farmers themselves you know I was looking at their skin I was like wow you look so much like the earth that you're taking care of so this for me became the visual anchor of the series, this idea of drawing these visual metaphors for you as a viewer to blur the line between man and land and to echo this idea that they're both eventually one and the same, that this is a very unique and close bond. Looking at, you know, water, the River Nile in Egypt, you know, the women left behind when a farmer commits suicide, the woman is suddenly thrust into this place of responsibility having to bear witness in her own way to her fate and what she's been left with, taking you know, care of the family, the land, and having to pay this debt that they've been left with. In Peru is uh, the country I photographed in recently that was in 2018, um, 2019 actually. And uh, what was really interesting for me in Peru was how positive the spirit of the people was, you know, this idea of the Pachamama or Mother Earth and the belief that Mother Earth will never disappoint us. And that even though on a daily basis, we're seeing a land that is not the same land that we had years ago, and it's not the same land that our ancestors had, and that the seasons are changing and we're really struggling to keep up. But we believe in the Pachamama, that the Pachamama will come through for us and we will be okay. For me, this was really um, heartwarming, you know, coming from city life, whether it's Cairo and, or London, where I spent most of my time and going and exploring, um, uh, you know, these, these lands and agriculture and being, you know, so disconnected from, from city life. It was really heartwarming for me to be confronted with this idea of faith and how much faith do we have in nature that nature is going to come through for us and again the idea of bearing witness to to that idea of faith and this fervent spirit that people had in it uh, was something that i thought was really beautiful and positive and i think increasingly as a documentary um, visual creator i feel like it's important to show positive uh, sentiment and solutions as well. Um, you know, like I'm always interested in issues and exploring these issues and showing them, but I think it's important to show positivity as well as much as possible. Again, continuing with the portraits of the women, it's a multi-layered series and the last chapter is hopefully gonna be in, be in the US once, um, you know, the curtains of COVID open up for all of us and I can travel. It's going to be my last chapter looking at mental health issues in the US and how it's impacting farmers, where, um, you know, increasingly a lot of farmers are killing themselves, usually shooting themselves, because again, of desperation and mental, mental health issues related to the burden of the, the land. And again, weather patterns changing erratically and them not being able to keep up with it. With every one of these images is a story. I mean, I know the story of every single farmer in these images. You know, in this particular case, this was one of the first images I made. And it's of a farmer who set himself on fire um, while his wife wasn't home. And she basically came back to find him, um, unfortunately, dead. Um, 
And this is another image that I made in the Palestinian territories. Trying again also to look at the details of the land and things that are related to agriculture, such as fire, water, air, light, all of these natural elements that you know are very much part of the farming process and very much related to elements of nature as well. So for me, this is, you know, again, a project that's really rooted in this idea of belonging and home. For me, farming, all of these issues are intertwined and they're all chapters in exploring, um, you know, my own relationship to the land, my own relationship to the world. And for me, these projects open the door to exploring issues that I really care about, to bearing witness to issues that I really care about and carrying the responsibility of relaying them to you as an audience. Um, having said that, I'd like to end with these words, you know, that I think really put together this idea of bearing witness and really punctuated in quite a way that we bear witness for the dead and the living. We must bear witness for the dead and the living. It's a sense of responsibility. And I feel like as a photographer, it's something that I'm privileged to carry with me um, by, you know, by virtue of what I've chosen to do with my life. I don't think of myself as much of a storyteller. I think of myself as somebody that explores issues in a visual way, in a way that I hope relays some kind of emotion of what I experienced as a viewer, what I experienced with the issue, how it touched me personally. And then I put the images out to you and hopefully they resonate with you one way or another. Um, I'd like to thank you. If you'd like to get in touch with me, I'm always, always happy to answer questions by email or anything that you may need. I'm always happy to help. I'm also on Instagram and Twitter not so much on Facebook. So if you'd like to get in touch with me, uh, please do so by those means. And thank you so much for having me. And I really hope that I've managed to inspire some thought, provoke some questions, and um, maybe it will take you time to come up with some answers. Thank you.